<clears throat> so, dear colleagues, welcome to the auditorium of the Words Museum, a contemporary art gallery that boasts in its collections pieces from world-renowned artists, uh, such as Munch, Picasso, Hockney, Pollock, Botero, or Warhol and others. And it is my great pleasure to introduce in such a wonderful venue uh, Rob Doyle, our third plenary speaker for the 16th International Conference of the Spanish Association for Irish Studies. So as many of you are aware of, Rob was born in Dublin and holds a first class honors degree in philosophy and an MPhil in psychoanalysis from Trinity College Dublin. His debut novel, which I am sure many of you have read, entitled Here Are the Young Men, was published in 2014, um, first by the Lilliput Press and then by Bloomsbury. And even though it would, be, it would be impossible to make it justice in just a couple of sentences for the barely one or two people in this room who have not read it already, um, Here Are the Young Men follows a group of Irish boys on their first summer of freedom after finishing a school, spent in the streets of Celtic era Dublin a summer fueled by alcohol, drugs, sex, and above all, existential crisis. A topic that I think we will be addressing later on in the interview and Q&A. Uh, this book has been described by the Irish Independent as dark and intoxicating, by the Sunday Times as a portrait of a jilted generation, and by the Guardian as powerful and provocative. It was actually one of Hot Press Magazine's 20 greatest Irish novels in 1916, and it has been hailed as the Irish train spotting. Uh, it was further chosen as book of the year by the Irish Times, the Sunday Times, the Sunday Business Post, and the Independent. And it was shortlisted as well in the best newcomer category for the Irish Book Awards. Um, his second book, a collection of stories entitled This is the Ritual, was published in January 2016. And is, if I might say so, clearly marked by the sexual content of some of the pieces within, as well as by the unrelenting nihilism of the work as a whole. And in case you don't own a copy of Rob's books already, he has brought some copies that are for sale there at 12 euros, and he will, of course, be happy to sign them for you once the session is over, of course. Uh, <laughs> not now. But moving on, apart from uh, his novel and collection of stories, Rob, Rob's fiction essays and criticism have appeared in The Guardian, The Observer, The Dublin Review, The Irish Times, The Sunday Times, The Sunday Business Post, Stinging Fly, Gors, Dalkley Archives Best European Fiction 2016, and many others. He is also the editor of the Dalkley Archives Anthology of Irish Literature, due for publication in later this year, and he's actually going to talk us uh, about it later on. And he has also played the lead role in Hit the North, a feature film directed by Daniel Sayer. So we are greatly honored to have Rob Doyle with us today. And on behalf of the organizing committee of the 16th International Conference of the Spanish Association for Irish Studies, I would like to thank him for kindly accepting our invitation to come to La Rioja. So without further ado, please join me in giving Rob a very warm welcome. First of all, just let me say a big thank you to, um, well, to Melania and to Jonathan and the rest of the uh, organizational committee for the conference. It's my first time to uh, attend one of these conferences, and I have to say it's been an immense pleasure so far. Um, I attended many very interesting talks, and thank you to all the delegates and participants too. I've attended many very interesting talks and um, hope to attend more. I've also made many new friends, which is as much of a pleasure. Um, so yesterday, like many of you, I went to a talk by, uh, a reading by Evelyn Conlon, and she had the very good idea of reading um, a short section from many of her books for somebody whose attention span is as completely shattered as my own. This was perfect. I thought, wow, what a great idea. Unfortunately, unlike Evelyn, I only have two books <laughs> to read from, so we're, you're stuck with that, I'm afraid. I'm going to give you a, a little jolt of both of these books uh, to, to, to sample 
what's going on. Um, and then I think we'll have some chat at the end. So, first of all, uh, I'm going to read from my most recent book, which is This is the Ritual. It's a collection of, let's say, linked, uh, connected short fiction, uh, short stories. Um, many of them are more or less explicitly autobiographical or deal with people and situations I've known, some of them not so much. Uh, and they're set in uh, a great many cities and places around the world, including Spain, actually. This is my first time in La Rioja. What a beautiful part of Spain. But there is a story here called Barcelona, which uh, uh, imaginatively is, is set in Barcelona. I, was never, I had never been there when I wrote the story, actually. I have been since. Anyway, I decided that today the story I will read from, it's a, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll only read a section of it. It's one called On Nietzsche. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, this is a story. When I was a few, a few years ago, I got the kind of obsessive idea into my head that I wanted to write a book about the great German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, who had been really, uh, who remains a, a passion, uh, let's say an intellectual passion of mine. I love his books, and I did then, and I decided I needed to write a book about this great writer. The only problem was my kind of life was falling apart around my ears at the time in many different ways, so it was not so easy to write a book about him. So as a kind of desperate last resort, I found myself without really knowing what I was doing, writing a story about a guy who is attempting to write a book about Friedrich Nietzsche as kind of the next best thing. Uh, so that's all I've got for you. <laughs> so let's hear some of that. Some time ago, as my 20s drew to a close, I became filled with an overwhelming desire to write a book about Friedrich Nietzsche, whose work had fascinated me since I'd first read him at age 19, exhilarated by the grandeur, strangeness, and brilliance of his thought. I can see now that the desire to write a book about Nietzsche disguised a deeper, more personal need to confront and drive out the sense of total futility that had pervaded my life and thoughts for more than a decade and had driven me to a despair so chronic and total it was no longer even perceptible. By way of a protracted and intensive engagement with the work of Nietzsche, I hoped to determine once and for all whether there was hope of ever forging a deeper, more sustaining sense of purpose in a world which, it seemed to me, had lost its vital illusions, its grand hopes, and its narrative direction. Most people who decide to write a book about Nietzsche or any philosopher will probably do so through the university system. And this is what my remaining academic acquaintances urged me to do, one former professor back in Dublin even offering to oversee my doctoral thesis. However, my desire to write about Nietzsche arose alongside another equally strong desire to travel, to move, to be elsewhere. I decided I would leave London at the soonest possible moment in the company of my girlfriend Natasha. I would cram my backpack with books by and about Nietzsche and work while on the move. Eventually I would stop in some attractive city or town, possibly Turin, where Nietzsche spent his last productive years before collapsing into insanity and begin refining the notes I, had, I would have made into the first draft of a book. It was not, however, possible for Natasha and me to leave London immediately. It would take us, Natasha calculated, another four months to save enough money to travel for a year or so, leaving behind the Hampstead flat in which we had both come to feel so trapped. Four months was plenty of time, she said, for me to lay the foundations of my book about Nietzsche. In the meantime, I turned 30. This was an interesting event. At 30, for the first time in my life, I began to dwell compulsively on the reality of my own death. This came as a surprise, not to say a shock. I had believed throughout my teens and 20s that I was the kind of person who thought of death a great deal. In fact, I prided myself on it. But I hadn't really been thinking about death, I saw now. I had merely been hypothesizing or play-acting. The surprise in genuinely confronting my own mortality was that it had less to do with the future, the coffin I'm bound for, 
than with the past. Specifically, death was knowing that my 20s, those horny, traumatic years, were gone forever. As a consequence of turning 30 and feeling the shadow of my own death fall on me for the first time, I looked in the mirror and said firmly that there was no more time to waste. Death had my scent now, and I needed to be absolutely ruthless and focused on what I wanted to achieve, which was to write a book about Nietzsche. This newfound sense of urgency at first seemed like a valuable asset and a consolation for the loss of my youth. Before long, however, I realized that it had the effect of inhibiting me from doing what I wanted, from doing anything at all. The sense of urgency was so strong that it became indistinguishable from the most crippling anxiety. I was unable to get down to anything other than worry about the hurtling of time and the blooming fortunes of my peers, most of whom had not squandered their 20s in a fog of drink, drugs, obsessive reading, and pointless travel, as I had. Seized by anxiety, I lost the ability to concentrate, or what little of it I had had to begin with. I was like an empty can, blown all over the place. Though I had spent my life doing little apart from reading, doing little so that I could read, it struck me as a wild presumption and madness to begin writing a book on Nietzsche without having read in their entirety certain other 19th century authors who, although having no direct bearing on Nietzsche, nonetheless constituted the deep background for any serious intellectual endeavor involving a subject from that era. I thought about all the significant 19th century books I still hadn't read, books which were invariably long and demanding, and the sheer scale of the task inhibited me from reading even one of them. Weeks passed and I read nothing. I just watched YouTube videos or loitered on Twitter where I saw writers five years younger than me announce the publication of their new books. A few times, unable to bear the internet any longer, I shut down my laptop, took a breath, and actually launched myself into some or other dusty volume. This is it, I would tell myself. The anxiety is clearing. A new phase commences. The crisis has passed. By the time I'd reached page five, though, I would have the niggling sense that I was reading the wrong 19th century author, wasting my time on a dispensable book during a period of great urgency. I shouldn't be reading Fichte, say, but von Hartmann, not Weber, but Spencer. By page 10 or 15, this niggling sense would rise to an intolerable howling in my skull. Fighting off panic, I would put away Fichte and switch to von Hartmann, only to quickly feel that I should really be reading Stendhal or Comte or whoever. By the end of the day, I'd be back on Twitter, all literature abandoned, or else I'd call Raoul, my alcoholic friend, to come out and get hammered with me. I thought of Raoul as my alcoholic friend as a way of denying my own undeniable alcoholism. What's worse, this is not even a revelation that came later on. I knew I was doing it even then, and I persisted in doing it. My mounting anxiety brought with it a heightened need to drink, because only when I was drinking was I able to forget the hurtling weeks, the pileup of years, and the fact that I wasn't achieving anything at all. And the less I achieved, the more I drank. And the more I drank, the less I achieved, I was able to achieve until my life consisted of waking up late, going on Twitter, opening a bottle of wine, and finally calling Raoul, my alcoholic friend, who eventually stopped taking my calls. During this period, while I was lost in a miasma of caffeine and alcohol, Natasha needed suddenly to return to Russia because her mother had fallen ill. Although I had never met Natasha's family, I knew they regarded me as a half-mad and wholly malign influence on their beautiful and intelligent daughter, who surely deserved better, deserved the, the hand of an oligarch or a media sorcerer, not the squalid, hamstead flat of an alcoholic, bookish weirdo. For several days before and after Natasha left for Russia, I was beset by fears that she would not return to London, or else that she would be unfaithful to me during her time away. Natasha had never done anything to warrant this latter suspicion. My insecurities, in truth, stemmed from an infidelity of my own, committed during the vaguely defined beginning of our relationship when the parameters had not yet been clearly established, or so I had told myself. Even now, four years on, I worried about the slow, secret evolution of this betrayal in Natasha's innermost heart and thoughts, despite her claim to have forgiven me and the consequences it might yet hatch. 
specifically revenge or abandonment. When Natasha left, I looked around their flat, trying to tell myself that she would surely return to London because so many of her possessions were still here. These included her cherished red shoes, the ones her father had bought her as a gift when they had spent Christmas on the French Riviera two years previously, and which she had grown attached to in a manner I privately considered darkly Freudian. Those shoes were a guarantee that Natasha would indeed return. Now, however, with Natasha away in Moscow and a great deal of time on my hands, I could do little but sit in the living room of our Hampstead flat up on the fifth floor, gazing at the wall or at the window, immobilized by dread at the scale of the task I had set for myself and my feelings of utter inadequacy before it. Not only did the list of authors on my background reading remain unread, but every day the list expanded as I thought of more and more authors who, if I were not to read them, would be unforgivable omissions from anything that called itself a serious book about Nietzsche. Soon it began to seem as if, in order to write as much as a single credible page about Nietzsche, I would have to read or reread the whole of the 19th century, and much of the 18th, 20th, and even 17th centuries as well. One midweek afternoon, I took myself out to Hampstead Heath for a long walk that I hoped would revive my spirits and infuse me with the vitality of the approaching summer. And out on the heath, I did feel better for about seven minutes. Then, without discernible reason, gloom and anxiety overcame me yet again. Roaming on the heath like King Lear, I felt like blowing my own head off or fleeing to Bangkok or Vientiane, where I would book myself into a cheap room and slowly drink myself to death, pausing only to fuck whores and write bitter, sarcastic letters to the great public figures of our age, blaming them for everything. Attempting to shake off these oppressive feelings and shady thoughts, I walked for hours on the heath, pacing from one end to the other, again and again across its vast and undulating surface by varying and convoluted routes. Had my pacing been witnessed from the air and then graphed onto a map, it seems to me now, the result would have resembled the last work of a depraved Viennese painter before he shot himself in the face. I thought hard on the course of that long, not to say interminable, walk. I decided it was foolish to put myself under the impossible obligation of reading the entire 19th century before writing about Nietzsche. Better to launch headlong into the writing itself, hurl myself at the project with a warlike and fearless mentality. The image in my mind, for better or worse, was of kamikaze pilots slamming into an iceberg. In the grip of these thoughts, while traversing the heath for perhaps the ninth or tenth time as the sunny afternoon gave way to an overcast and chilly evening, I found myself reflecting on my first encounter with Nietzsche more than a decade earlier. I had discovered Nietzsche's work in a cubicle in the men's toilets in the Dublin Mail Centre, a colossal grey building in a business park in Clondalkin, where I worked for three awful years, starting when I was 19, a period when I was danger dangerously depressed, impervious to all but the most experimental of medications. I hated the place, hated the people, hated myself for being there. The DMC felt to me like a concentration camp or a prison colony out of dystopian science fiction. The incessant noise of the mail sorting machines made conversation impossible, which was just as well considering that the workers who had manned the machines for years and decades were such mindless, half-demented credence. Bitter and resentful of everything, I calculated that for at least an hour during each of my four-hour shifts, I could remove myself unnoticed from the workstations and hide in the toilets where I was able to read. Reading, I felt, would partly justify my having to be in that horrible building giving my time to those wretched machines and their wretched human overseers. With the machines screaming outside the toilet doors, I settled in and began reading Nietzsche. I got through The Antichrist, Human All Too Human, Twilight of the Idols, On the Genealogy of Morals, and half of Thus Spoke Zarathustra over a period of several months. I should have quit the place, but the psychoanalyst I was seeing advised against making any major changes in my outward life, especially ones that would feed into what he saw as my dominant, dangerous tendency, 
withdrawing from human society into solitude, into silence, into stinking toilet cubicles. As I paced across the heath, I grew more certain that the only hope I had of writing something honest, vital, and true about Nietzsche lay in attacking the project in a more personal, urgent, even autobiographical manner, to write in blood in Nietzsche's own words. Perhaps, I thought, I should even write about that vile and stinking toilet in the Dublin Mail Center, or about the post-Christian e in order to see what that said about Nietzsche, or about the post-Christian epoch more generally, if it said anything at all. It might even be possible, I thought, growing increasingly excited by the idea as I tramped over the heath, to frame my study of Nietzsche around the image of that stinking toilet, which would speak eloquently to any discerning reader of the death of God, the putrefying carcass of God, not to mention the cauldron of depravity and hate underlying Christian slave morality. The filthy toilet was Christian morality itself, it seemed to me, then tramping across the heath. I returned to the flat late that evening, greatly relieved, with the sense I had finally discovered a way in to my project. I resolved that as soon as I left London and began my travels in Europe, I would begin writing in blood. I slept soundly that night for what felt like the first time in months. At this point, just when it was most crucial for me to save money so that, I, so that I could get away from the wretched Hampstead flat, which had begun to feel like a tomb or like the inside of my own skull, the philosophy tutoring work I had been relying on inexplicably dried up. Alarmed, I emailed the tutoring agency, but my queries went unanswered. I called the office, but everyone I spoke to was vague and evasive, suggesting that responsibility lay elsewhere. The suspicion grew in me that this sudden, drastic diminishment in my employment was related to a regrettable and worthless story of mine, which had been published a couple of years previously in a scarcely credible online literary journal, so-called. The story concerned a drug dealer who spent his days hovering on the fringes of parks and children's playgrounds, often masturbating furtively in the bushes or just squeezing his balls through his trouser pocket. By night, he wrote hate-fueled tracts about redneck hordes, girly girls, and demon queers, which he posted to Bashar al-Assad, Jerry Adams, and Kanye West, neither expecting nor receiving any response. In what I had considered a daring postmodern flourish, I named this hateful and charmless character after myself, though he had nothing in common with me beyond an addiction to salt and vinegar Pringles and an uncontrollable twitch in his left eye. The story, Permanent Erection, had been written and submitted in a single evening while I was hammered on red wine and had afforded Raoul and me a night of fantastic cackling. However, as soon as I had sobered up, I realized that publishing this story online and framing it in such a way that the reader might assume it expressed my own true, shameful fantasies might not have been the wisest of moves. In a series of increasingly frantic emails to the journal's editor, I attempted to retract the story and have it taken off the internet. None of these emails was even acknowledged. It dawned on me that the online journal had been abandoned after its first issue, and no one was going to bother taking it down. That story goes on for quite a while uh, longer, so I'll leave it at there. I'll, I'm going to spoil the ending for you. He never writes the book. The book <laughs> never gets, and his girlfriend doesn't come back. It's, it's a heartbreaker, really. It's tragic. <laughs> um, I never wrote a book about Nietzsche, either. Um, now, so I thought I would also give a reading from uh, Here at a Young Man, which is my first book, my first novel, which was published uh, three years ago in 2014. Uh, it's the first time in a while that I've read from this book, and I think I'm going to read a section which I've never read before, so uncharted territories, as it were. Um, I, today, actually, I... I um, attended a paper that was given on this book on the subject of impotence 
physical and psychological in here at a young man. It was terrifying, said so Richard. I, I, I can tell you. <laughs> I'll be having a nightmare. I'll be talking, I'll be seeing a psychoanalyst about that someday. Anyway, uh, I'm going to read from about two thirds of the way through the book, so let me fill in the background a little bit. The narrator, Matthew, is a young guy. He's about 17 or 18 years age, of age. He's just finished his leaving cert, which is, you know, the end of secondary school in Ireland. And he and his mates have basically very. They don't, they're not really um, uh, active citizens. They're not really interested in anything apart from getting screwed up on drugs and drink and kind of uh, getting off their heads for days on end. Matthew has just had uh, a very humiliating breakup with, with this girl who he's been kind of quite secretly in love with for, for quite a, a long time, and it's all gone to hell. And so as, a way, you know, as, as, as men will do, maybe women too, he's decided that the best way to uh, face up to his emotional problems is to go out and get completely wrecked for about four days on end. So where I'm going to read from is about two days into this sleepless uh, binge of you know, a variety of drugs and stuff. He's with his much older friend, Skag, who's an old Dublin punk. Anyone who's been to Dublin has probably seen these characters. You know, they, they've looked the same way for the last 30 years, and they, you know, they've got the tattoos, and they've got the, the badges, and their leather coats. And uh, so this guy is much older, and he's a bit of a drug dealer, a bit of a dodgy character, but Matthew, feeling particularly nihilistic and pissed off, is, has been hanging around with him and maybe getting in over his head. So they've just spent the night in a hostel with a couple of uh, Norwegian, slightly older than Matthew, Norwegian girls who have been, you know, coming to Dublin on the kind of tourist wave. It's the middle of the summer. We left the girls in their one bedroom the next morning. It must have been about nine o'clock, a reassuringly, reassuringly grey Saturday morning in the city centre. Dublin waking up, but not yet overrun by the shopping hordes that would descend upon it by noon. We helped ourselves to a free breakfast on the way out. In a dining area with breakfast is strictly for paying guests only, printed on a sign on the wall. We hadn't slept. Skag had had sex once more with Nikki, but this time Lorna and I had left the room, walking upstairs to the rooftop and looking out at the river and the buildings on the other quay, watching Dublin stumble home to bed, howling at taxis and vomiting on its shoes. We had kissed again, but that was as far as it went. Lorna had told me I reminded her of herself when she was my age. We had taken a good bit of coke by that stage and I felt sure of myself once more. Then we had gone back downstairs and the four of us danced, laughed and chatted as the river outside slowly ran a dull gray, then murky blue and it was dawn. Before leaving, Skag had assured the girls that we'd be seeing them again and taking their phone, mobile numbers and emails. We stepped out on the street after breakfast, our dilated pupils stabbed by the sudden glare. Skag looked up and down the quiet street. Sleep is for pedophiles, he said softly. Where to, I asked, energized by the cool morning air. Fancy another schniffle, he said, clapping his hands together vigorously, as if he just stepped out after a good night's sleep. I'm all right for now, I said. I'm still high as fuck. But as soon as I said this, I felt not quite as high as I had been. Coming down, I remembered Jen, the scene in her room, the humiliation. Getting with Lorna had helped, but the pain was still there. Actually, now that you say it, I wouldn't mind another whack. Come on over to the boardwalk. We crossed the Haypenny Bridge and sat on the bench on the wooden river walkway. A junkie staggered along and was about to pester us for smokes and money, but Skag shot him a look and he kept going. Then Skag took out a, the coke he had siphoned off the girl's purchase. He produced a key, put a little heap on the end that held it up to his nose to snort. Puntitos, they called him in South America. That's how they do it over in Bolivia, he said, after he had taken the hit. He sorted one out for me, and I sniffed it up. He looked at me and laughed. We are all in the gutter, Matthew, but some of us are smoking crack, 
Watching a pigeon on a handrail a while later, he said, so tell us about this board you were seeing. Ah, there's not much to it, I said. I told him about Jen, how I'd liked her for years, but it was wrecked already. Yeah, I used to get like that about women, he said. Not anymore. There's no point. Listen, the whole aim of a woman's existence is to get impregnated when it comes down to it. Seriously, I like them for their bodies, but that's about it. Psychologically, I'm a total faggot. I suppose, I said. Some of them can be nice, though. I remember a girlfriend I had once, he said. We were together for a couple of years, and she started getting hysterical for me to inseminate her. She said it was the next logical step in our relationship. Jesus fucking Christ, the next logical step. I had to laugh at that. We were arguing about it one night, and she goes to me, but that's what we're here for. And I says, yeah, maybe it is. But if bacteria could speak, they'd say the same thing. And that was the end of us. He chuckled at the memory, untroubled by remorse. We sat and watched the oily drift of the river for a spell. Early house, he said, okay. We got a few points into us in a dim pub called the Bald Goat, drinking amidst the usual haggard old bastards, surly alcoholics and darts players. Skag had gotten an Irish Times from the bar, and after four points or, points or so, he said, look, Matteo, the Festival of World Culture is on out in Dunleary. We head out just for the crack. I said I was up for it. I texted Cocker to see if he'd come too. The reply came seconds later. He'd meet us in there in an hour. We finished our pints of Guinness. Then Skag rolled a spliff and we headed out into the fully awakened city. Along the coast of Dunleary, the train was crammed full of young people heading to the festival. Within minutes of boarding the train, Skag had commanded the attention and allegiance of the entire carriage. He held court for the whole journey, throwing out one-liners about fellow passengers, randomers outside the windows, and the parts of Dublin we chugged past on our way. Skag! The roar came from the back of the carriage. I jerked my head around, expecting confrontation. But it was a friend, one of Skag's punk and junk companions from the 80s, the decade when, as he had told me earlier, Everyone was poor as fucking on the dole, but we all had a great time. The city wasn't stuck up its own arse back then. The wrinkled, leathery punk shoved his way from the back of the carriage to step into Skag's court, where some Italian lads with dreadlocks had gathered to skin up and be entertained by his banter. How are you doubt all, said Skag. Jesus, it's been a while. I thought you were dead. I am dead. I'm dead inside. Dowdall cackled at his own slurred wit and cracked open a can of devil's bit. He had a nose ring and his dirty grey blonde hair was spiked up with grease. There were metal studs on his leather jacket and damned clash and paranoid vision badges sewn in drunken swerves along the arms. He looked ridiculous, a farce of all that punk once was. This is me mate Matthew, said Skag, slapping me on the shoulder. How you, grunted Dowdall, would complete this interest. Dowdall here used to play bass with Mickey and the Master Race, Skag informed me. All oh, right, yeah, I said, acting impressed, even though I'd never heard of him. Here now, not to mention three years and two albums with footnotes to Plato and a tour of Slovenia with abject phallus, said Dowdall, wagging his finger like a schoolteacher. The footnotes were a serious punk act. Not like these gobshite posers you get nowadays. Am I right, Skag? You just had your own moments, said Skag. Come here, Skag. I hear you think you're a writer now, said Dowdall. Yeah, sometimes I catch myself thinking that, replied Skag. I put out a book there a while back. That's what I heard, said Dowdall. Don't go expecting me to read it now. Skag the poet, what? Merciful Jesus. I can imagine what they wrote in the biography yoke at the back. Skag was awarded a C plus in English for his junior cert. His ma considers him one of the top five writers to have slithered out from between her legs. He divides his time between Dolphin's Barn and the Walkins Town Roundabout. Skag granted him a wry chuckle. Yeah, that's it, more or less. I, couldn't re I don't really think of myself as an author, though. I'm more of a conduit. There's a force deep down inside me. He speaks, and I just write it down. I call him the fat controller. I laughed, but I wasn't sure I was meant to.
I've got two more books almost finished, said Skag. Sincerely L. Cohen and Fine Day for a Holocaust Denial. He paused to observe a passing arse, then added, I'm thinking of putting them out under my pseudonym. What's that? Seamus Heaney. Good night and good luck, said Dowdo. So is you, are you on your way out to the festival? Yeah. Sure, we thought we may as well. Young Matthew here has had some lady trouble. His tender young heart is in danger of being broken, so I'm taking him under my wing for a bit of a blowout to cheer him up. Yourself? Yeah, I'm going out. I couldn't give a fuck about the festival, but there's a board out there I have to see. A little Spanish thing. Mad for me Mickey, she is. Blank Frank has some yips for me as well. Oh, yeah, said Skag. Haven't seen all frankincense in a while. How many are you getting? Ten. Do you want some? Skag hissed, all indignant. Does a bear shit on the Pope? When have you ever known me not to want some fucking yokes? There were thousands thronging the seafront out at Dunleary, sitting on the grass, drinking cans and bottles. There seemed to be little point in being there other than to drink and talk in proximity to others who were drinking and talking too. There was a huge stage up near the 40 foot, but we felt no desire to push through the hordes to hear better the world music that was blasting from it. I called Cocker and we shouted into our phones till we found each other. Any relation to Jarvis, said Skag when I introduced him. Yeah, I'm his da, replied Cocker. Skag laughed. <laughs> I thought so. Right then, lads, I'll he head off now for it. I'll be back in a bit. I have another mate around here I have to see. I'm going to drop in on him. Doubt all. If I don't get to Frank's before you leave, get me them, yo them yokes and I'll fix you up later. Skag ducked into the crowd. Then me and Cocker walked off with Dowdo, stepping over hands and legs till we were out past the thickest crowds. These are some weird looking cunts, Cocker muttered. We followed Dowdo down a side street, passing big, rich houses where I wouldn't have minded living, but knew I never would. Blank Frank was paying a home visit to one of his wealthier customers. Dowdall phoned him when we got to the house. Frank appeared a moment later at the second story window, mobile at his ear, gazing down at us. He was huge, bald, bearded, and leather clad. Blank, Blank Frank was an old school biker. Dowdall hung up. We've got to go upstairs, he told us. Now don't go making bollocks of yourselves, do you hear me? These lads won't see the funny side. In a quiet voice, he said, Frank is, he has his problems. He isn't that bad when you get to know him, but it's very easy to set him off, and that's not something you want to see. We ascended a marble staircase, passing framed posters of Bruce Lee and Eric Cantona, and stepped into the sitting room. Other than blank Frank, who used to be called Frank the Fuck when he, play, when he did vocals for consumers of atrocity back in the 80s, as Dowdall had told us on the way, there was a bulky crew-cut lad with suspicious eyes. He wore a white t-shirt with Prada printed ac brazenly across the collar. Though it was clearly this man's house we were in, he had that inner city look to him, the raw, blemished face. There were two women as well, in their mid-twenties, both, both of them trashily blonde, faces caked with makeup. One of them was resurfacing from the cocaine she'd just been hoovering up from the glass table. She regarded us coldly. Blank Frank looked at me and Cocker. This is just Matthew, Dowdall said, and that's his mate. Blank Frank the fuck shrugged. So how's things, Dowdall? Long time no see. Bottles of beer were offered all around by our jerky, shifty host, who had obviously done plenty of coke before we arrived. The girl said little, lighting cigarettes and watching us with hard, cynical faces. Cut them a line, Eileen, will you? said the host. Seamus. He was an erratic in a rich suburb like Don Leary. Dowdall, Seamus, and Blank Frank sat down around a low wooden table on one side of the huge room and started exchanging stories and jokes. Me and Cocker sat on a couch, listening to their loud, aggressive, uneasy laughter. After some chat, Frank asked Dowdall how many yokes he wanted. Ten for me, said Dowdall. We'll take ten as well, said Cocker. Frank the fuck looked up. Cocker fidgeted beside me, putting the money back in his pocket. The girls watched Frank. Suddenly he made a sweeping gesture and said, come on up here, lads, sit down with us for fuck's sake. You're looking all lonesome over there, hugging you our beers. We shuffled over 
smiling awkwardly, and sat down with them. Now, now Frank was slamming his massive paw on the table and saying, Doubt all, did I ever tell you about the time me and Seamus here got caught with 500 yokes outside the point when Orbital were playing? No, what happened? Just get arrested. No, hang on, I'll, hang on, I'll tell you. We're just outside the entrance, about to get in past the security. The plan was to sell the yokes inside, and suddenly this plain clothes con comes out of nowhere. I've still no idea how he knew he had this stuff, but he grabs hold of Seamus' shoulder and he starts screaming into his walkie-talkie, and he's obviously calling the lads for reinforcements. And while your man has his hand there, Seamus just looks at me for a moment, and then he turns around and crack, he loafs him right in the face. See, a man goes down like a fucking sack of shite, and we leg it, pegging it down along the keys, in through the IFSC. We leg it down this lane and went into a pub, and that was that. They didn't catch up with us. We ended up going on to some fucking club. Where was it? Spirit. And selling most of the yokes in there instead. And all I remember is Seamus wearing the face off this big, fat, trendy board. And the next thing, I followed him into the jacks, and he's riding her over the fucking sink. Seamus was slapping his thigh and laughing proudly at the anecdote. Ah, yeah, but you know what they say, lads. When the war is raging, every hole is a trench. Fuck me, though. That was a good night. I was still pissed off we never got to see Orbital, though. Orbital, now there's a great band, said Cocker, nodding his head, even though he had never listened to them in his life. No one paid him any regard. Seamus said... The next morning, I bought an Aer Lingus ticket to Amsterdam, and I fucking stayed over there for nearly two months. I was shitting it that they were going to hunt me down and lock me up for years. Do you remember that time we dropped a fuckload of acid and went to see Blade in the big Cineplex on Parnell Street? Do you remember that? Fucking right I do, said Frank the fuck. Or at least I remember coming to my senses in the cell the next morning. Fucking hell. Seamus was in tears of laughter. After a couple of false starts, he managed to get a few sentences out to deliver the anecdote. We'd taken a whole sheet between the two of us, and we were just getting into the film, which is total shite, by the way. And Frank was gone dead quiet, just fucking engrossed in the film, or so I thought. And then, completely all of a sudden, like, he starts screaming his head off, just fucking screaming like some mental or this mad high-pitched fucking noise. It was like he was on fire or something, some mad fucking animal. He had his hands to his face, and it was like he was trying to tear the skin off it. And all the time, these mad fucking screams coming out of him. People were legging it out of the cinema and everything, thinking it was some kind of fire. I don't know what the fuck. And I'm just sitting there pissing myself laughing. And the next thing, Frank is leaping up on the seat, lashing out at everything. Kick me in the fucking jaw. Then he falls over into the next row and gets up, still screaming his fucking head off and clawing at his face, and he legs it down the aisle, out of the cinema, into the fucking foyer, or whatever you call it, upstairs where the bar is. By the time I managed to get up and leg it out after him, he couldn't go on because he was laughing too much. We were all laughing by now. After a while, Seamus controlled it enough to continue. And so I leg it out after him, and I'm completely off my fucking tits as well, and every cunt in the cinema is standing there in shock, staring at this mad cunt. And he's after leaping in behind the bar, and he's just pulling bottles down off the rack, whiskey, vodka, all kinds of shit, and he's fucking them out of the bar, at the walls, onto the ground. He must have smashed about 30 bottles by the time this big gollywog security guard came bursting in and floored him. Kicked the fucking shit out of me too while I was on the ground, said Brank Frank pr proudly. Or he must have done, because when I woke up in the cell, I was in a right fucking state. My head was like the fucking elephant man. He did, he knocked the bollocks out of you, Frank. He had to, he fucking had to. You looked like you were a total fucking psychopath. Every psycho there was shit, every fucker there was shitting themselves. They thought you were going to kill someone. It's a miracle I didn't. Whirling all them glass bottles across the gaff like that, said Frank, wistfully, eyes wet from laughing. What did the police do, I asked. Not a fucking thing. I was able to convince them that I was off my trolley and therefore my actions were beyond my control. It wasn't that hard to do. Only a fucking genuine nut job would do something like that. That's how they saw it. They weren't fucking wrong, declared Dowdo. I better leave it there. Thanks very much. So, um, Rather than go on uh, about my own work for a while, just something I wanted to talk about for a couple of minutes.
before we have a bit of a chat is uh, something that I think and hope would be of interest to anyone with, a, with a, an angle on Irish studies, particularly Irish literature, is that this autumn, uh, I think late September, there will be a book published, uh, which I've been editing over the last couple of years. Um, there's a publisher, an international publisher, called the Dawkey Archive, which Jonathan mentioned at the beginning. Some of you may know, they, for years, they've done a marvelous job of publishing, uh, let's say, experimental literature from around the world, be it fiction, nonfiction, poetry, anything. Much of it in translation, much of it uh, in some of it in uh, English, you know, they've got Korean, they've got Asian series, they've got South America, you name it. Anyway, this publisher decided to put together an Irish, uh, an anthology of Irish literature, which uh, I think will be the first ever of the many anthologies that have been put out of Irish literature. This will be the first one that celebrates and focuses exclusively on what we might call the experimental strain in Irish literature, the experimental tradition in Irish literature. Um, this is something that I feel quite strongly about as, uh, as a reader, as well as as a writer. Um, I think that it's almost like there are two parallel traditions in Irish literature. And one of them that gets, I think, a lot of the airtime at the moment and a lot of the acclaim and a lot of the publicity is something I guess we're pretty good at. You might call it melancholy realism or melancholy naturalism, uh, a kind of subtle, poignant, uh, very finely tuned kind of short story or, or novel, um, which has kind of risen to predominance so that you might think, people might think that Irish literature is kind of synonymous with that. Uh, and indeed, some of our greatest writers have in the past and in the present written in that tradition of, let's call it melancholy realism. Um, and there's some amazing books have been written in that. However, at the same time, there's this other rich, incredibly rich, vibrant tradition in Irish literature of the experimental kind of variety. This is going all the way back, and this anthology, this Dawkey Archive anthology, due out in the autumn, celebrates this by going all the way back 300 years or so to the time of Lawrence Stern, who wrote the great uh, Tristram Shandy. Uh, despite its age, it still reads as one of the great kind of postmodern novels, uh, way before anyone even knew there was such a word, way before as Steve Coogan, the comedian, once said, it was postmodern before there was any modern to be post about. Uh, uh, and again, he's one of those authors, a bit like James Joyce, who has been taken on by the English as uh, an English author. Like Iris Murdoch, so I was very heartened to see somebody giving a paper on Iris Murdoch yesterday. Uh, another great writer who the English have tried to reclaim for themselves. She's not. She's an Irish writer. I'm not much of a patriot or a nationalist, but, you know, there's a, there's a line. Anyway, ever since Tristram Shandy and Lawrence Stern, going through authors like Jonathan Swift, the great author of not only Gulliver's Travels, but also some brilliantly subversive, comic, uh, sometimes shocking texts, there has been this tradition of experimentalism, playfulness, invention, um, sabotage, subversion, transgression, um, anarchy, humor, wit, and a kind of formal originality. When you think about probably the three most celebrated Irish writers of the 20th century, uh, I guess there would be James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, who a lot of people have been talking about over the last few days, and Flann O'Brien, which again, at least one person is talking about. Uh, in, a, in Ireland, we tend to kind of rave about how great these authors were, while in a sense ignoring their, uh, the, the vast possibilities they've opened up for literature. And so it seems to me that there is a space to talk about and to focus on this tradition again of uh, 
again, the experimental tradition in Irish literature. A figure like Flann O'Brien, uh, I have a suspicion that he's more widely read and maybe more widely revered outside of Ireland than he is within Ireland, and that his explosively original work has had greater reverberations outside of Irish literature than it has within Irish literature. Um, Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian, an absolutely colossal figure, one of the most original writers ever, and most, in, uh, most uh, exciting writers ever, was directly inspired by Flann O'Brien. When he read O'Brien's great first novel, At Swim, Two Birds, he wrote the first international review of it, and he said something like, I have traversed many uh, linguistic labyrinths, but none have been more complex than this novel by the Irishman, Flann O'Brien. So, um, one thing, because the, you know, the, the title of this conference is about female, fee slash male challenges and Irish studies, I should mention that as I was uh, compiling this anthology and trying to find who are the authors who were doing formally inventive, experimental, kind of disruptive, playful, exuberant things, rather than kind of working within that other tradition, I did, um, I was trying to be conscious of including, you know, as many women as men. There were, there were not, it was not so easy to find women who were writing this kind of thing 200 years ago. You know, there are exceptions. George Egerton is one. There were a couple of exceptions um, for reasons I guess we all know, you know, whatever the society looked like at the time. Maybe there were great writers who we'd never heard about and they weren't published. Anyway, as it came closer to the modern era, and particularly the last, let's say, 40 years, and particularly the contemporary moment, there was an efflorescence of female writers who were doing completely startling um, things. So it became a lot easier to kind of give a, a, a wider, more various, more diverse selection as it got closer to the present day. Anyway, that's it. I guess that was talking about my own work because that's a bit of a plug for a book. I think it's going to be called The Other Irish Tradition, published by Docky Archives. In, and I would urge anyone, again, who has an interest in Irish literature, Irish studies in general, to keep an eye out for it. Uh, I think I'm quite proud of it. I think it will really open up a conversation about, again, an incredibly rich and um, internationally influential strain in Irish literature that should be celebrated more. Okay. So thank you very much, Rob, for this terrific uh, reading. And I'm, I'm sure, actually, that everyone, both here and those watching us online, will agree with me that this has been a fantastic uh, reading of your two books and the discussion of the, uh, of the anthology you're working on. Uh, I'm sure that our delegates will have lots of questions for you, but I think I'll begin with a couple of ones myself in order to break the ice. And as a matter of fact, I would like to begin uh, by touching on some of the issues you have mentioned um, just a few minutes ago in your discussion of the anthology, but which also relate to your first novel and to, the, to your collection of short stories. And I guess my question is, how do you find it as a contemporary Irish authors to have to work under the weight of what we might call in block capitals Irish literature? I mean, does one nowadays feel the pressure of, of all the literature that has been written before? And I'm interested in this, uh, firstly, from the point of view of when you first published here as a young man, um, as a first time author who actually seems to deviate from the social realist tradition of Irish literature. And secondly, from the point of view of this is the ritual, uh, the first story there being somehow a cunning takedown on Ireland's literary past, especially Joyce's Ulysses. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that actually I didn't feel, when I first started to write, no, I, I definitely didn't feel this weight of the, the tradition of Irish literature. In fact, I think 
I felt particularly free of that in a way, maybe more so than, than other writers, partly because um, I think when I was younger, I'm one of those people who just had a bad attitude towards uh, stuff in general when I was a, when I was a youngster, yeah? Like teenager tw in my 20s and so on. And so Irish literature, I just ignored it. I, you know, I was reading voraciously all the time, but I had this idea in my head that Irish literature was something that was almost aggressively neglecting the world as I saw it and the kind of things I was confronted by, the, 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 the world as it presented itself to me, which I found, you know, like most people do, quite startling and terrifying. I felt that Irish literature just was speaking from maybe a different social class and speaking in almost a different language. So I ignored it for years and I read every other country's literature, you know, I ignored where I came from. And, um, and maybe that was, you know, maybe that wasn't such a bad thing because then it, when I was writing my first book, of course I felt a kind of pressure to make it live up to some expectation that I had, but it wasn't the legacy of Joyce or the legacy of, you know, John McGahern or something like that. It was maybe the legacy of Roberto Bolaño or Martin Amis or, you know, any number of other authors. I know that I've had conversations with many authors or read interviews with many authors, Irish authors of a generation maybe somewhat older than mine. And there seems to be this uh, common thing that I've heard a lot that yeah, it was a real pressure writing under the shadow of James Joyce because he's, again, this colossus who achieved something immense and subverted the entire English language in a way uh, and wrote about Dublin, you know, forensically wrote about Dublin and Dublin life and Dublin dialect and all of that stuff. And I can totally understand how that could be a, a daunting situation to feel the legacy of Joyce. I never had it because I kind of ignored not so much Joyce, but all of the Irish literature. It's only in the last half decade or more that I've vigorously engaged with the Irish literary tradition. And now I probably read as much Irish stuff, be it old or new, as I do, you know, let's say world literature or Latin American literature or European or French literature. Um, so I've kind of, it's bringing it all back home in a way, you know, coming back to like one of those people that they travel for a long time and only after all that traveling do they really start to appreciate their native country. I was a bit like that, literally a bit like that, but also a bit like that with the Irish literature. Well, thank you very much. Then I feel there's another question that is bound to come up, to come up at some point, and it's uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, I mean, he permeates both of your books, but I think, like in the, the sensation I have after reading them, is that uh, Nietzsche plays a different role in your novel and in your collection of short stories. In your novel, it is as if it was, uh, it's always there, it permeates some of the characters, but in This is the Ritual, it is as if you needed Nietzsche to be a character himself, somehow. And I was wondering if you could expand on the issue of the weight of Nietzsche and his ideas in both of your two books. How does it differ? I mean, this is the original. It's clearly more uh, has more Nietzsche because it has the shortest story you have read. But yeah, sure. But you are right that actually the first book is um, infused with, or it's 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 full of uh, Nietzsche quotations actually that I just didn't. Uh, I've kind of always liked the vandal idea, you know, smash and grab and. And the taking thing, the whole idea of intellectual copyright and so on, I'm not so sure about. Um, so the both books are full of Nietzsche. I often feel a little bit uncomfortable when I talk about the relationship of this, you know, 19th century quite intense German philosopher Nietzsche to my work because I think it might give the mistaken impression that my work is intensely cerebral and it's very maybe alienatingly philosophical and I, I really don't think it is. I think like the stuff I write about tends to be uh, 
the blood and guts of life and longing and fear and loneliness and madness and uh, and love and sex and all of that stuff you know the blood and the, the blood and the guts of life however it is true that um, of the many authors I've had intense personal relationships with as anyone who reads or writes does Nietzsche has been a long-standing um, fascination profound fascination uh, still now I mean I think it's 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 kind of amazing that he ever even existed. So improbable, so uh, so so startling, a visionary. And I suppose when I when I maybe other people had it, the same experience with different authors, but when I fell for Nietzsche stuff when I was younger, I fell hard, and you know, I guess spent years in a state of shock and uh, exaltation. Seeing this, seeing the world, and seeing human life through a kind of Nietzsche and prism, uh, he, you know, he turns all the values that I was brought up to live by on their head. Uh, so it's 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 a seismic event, or it was for me anyway, to stumble upon this genius philosopher who had kind of foreseen a hundred years ago had foreseen the entire kind of modern trauma prophetically almost, uh, and who went so deep into shocking areas of speculation and truth and vision that nobody had even touched upon before. So it just became inevitable, really, that as I wrote my first couple of books, that would be in the background. It is very much in the background, his thought. He has, obviously, a, a quite stark and frightening and uh, heroic vision of human destiny and the cosmos and so on, um, and pitiless views about morality all very scary stuff. Um, so when you come from the kind of background that I come from, which is not like that, you know, I come from a Catholic, working class, Irish, you know, suburban background where <laughs> there's a very firm, fixed moral universe and life is peachy and so on. Uh, when you kind of go off the, d the deep end Personally, as you know, I did, as a lot of the characters you know, I write about go off the deep end in terms of madness and drug abuse and you know, deviant psychology and so on. Uh, and then you confront this kind of philosophical vision of uh, you know, the world hurtling through an empty abyss and all the ramifications of that. It's very, it's very, uh, it's very powerful and it's bound to turn up just as. Nietzsche was bound to write about Schopenhauer or his past influences. It's, it's the same thing, you know. Thank you. Um, let's not get too far away from the issue. Uh, let's do so by focusing on this is the ritual more. I mean, the comical nature of the first story there, John Paul Finnegan, poultry realist, somehow contrasts with the seriousness of the rest of the collection and what we were discussing right now. And the thing is that in an interview with the Irish Times last year, you mentioned that you conceived this initial piece rather as an afterthought to the collection itself. And yet it, it constitutes a, a brilliant opening and a bold one for what it comes next. And I guess my question is whether you somehow were trying to achieve, uh, I mean, whether this comic nature was a sort of comic relief uh, in order to make up for the seriousness that comes then and, and in order to, to, to cope with the fact that you open up in, in this book as you, as you mentioned earlier because it's highly autobiographical. Yeah, um, just to let people know, the first story, John Paul Finnegan, Paltry Realist, that you mentioned is the, it's the opening story of this is the ritual and it takes place on a ferry on its way back between Britain and uh, Dublin, a ferry that many Irishmen, re Irishmen returning from England have taken. And it's basically two people having this demented, furiously bitter, crazed dialogue, more of a monologue of one character, ranting about Irish pretensions and Irish literary pretensions and the commodification of Irish literature and the kind of political, the masturbatory political uh, exploitation of James Joyce by you know people who have no intention of ever reading him and so on. But it's all very comical and uh, 
not, not very serious in some ways. And actually, I didn't want to put that story into the book. Uh, my editor insisted that I did, and furthermore insisted that I put it at the beginning. And actually, I th both of my editors said that, and I think they were correct, because uh, it, 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 it's a way in, and it kind of sets the scene for what comes next. However, I will disagree with you a little bit in that I agree that what comes next is a whole very, you know, serious. It's uh, again like I'm trying to write about. You know, the, the, the stakes should be high when you write. You know, I, I don't want to mess around. I don't want to put stuff out into the world that has no. That doesn't respect. That doesn't reflect my experiences as a human being with all of the traumas and mysteries and so on that go with that. So it is serious. However. I kind of find almost, not all of them, but most of the stories in there, I had a great laugh writing them. And I kind of always know that my sense of humor is not necessarily going to be everybody else's. But even some of the bleakest stories, or the most sexually uh, aberrant stories, I, I, you know, or stories about people who are gone furthest off the deep end into uh, craziness. I just find a lot of humor in those stories, too. I, I don't really read a lot of stuff that isn't funny in some... I don't really love... Almost all of the writing I love is funny in some way. Even Nietzsche is. Borges is very funny. Even if it's not in a very direct... You know, you don't have to crack jokes to, 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 to write funny stuff. And I guess the stuff I love is stuff where you're reading it going, is this even supposed to be funny? You know? Uh, so maybe... Maybe it's all just a private joke. I think when, I, when, when this book came out, about 50% of the reviewers talked about how nihilistic the, the ambience was and how bleak some of the stories were, and they never really mentioned humor. And then the other 50% really talked up how funny it was, which was kind of gratifying because, um, bec because it's, it's, it made sense to me that yeah, it's, it's not, not everyone is going to find that stuff funny. Yeah, I guess it depends on the reader, but sure. you do certainly achieve uh, that tone of humor within the seriousness of the of the collection. So many thanks for this. We're running a bit late, but I think that, that at this stage of the session, um, we should let our audience have their say, because I, I'm sure many of you have questions for Rob, especially after one of the papers this morning focusing on, on your first book. So the floor is yours. Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, so I think, well, I'm sure many people might find signs of misogyny in your books, particularly in some of the characters. How dare you? <laughs> Particularly in some of the characters in here, the young men. So I would love you to comment on that. Yeah, um, that's yeah, fair question. Um, where to start? I suppose, actually, as the paper you gave today, I thought so excellently brought out. This is very much uh, a novel about young men and uh, at times dreadful, at times unbearable um, pressures they have on them to live up to a certain view of masculinity, a certain sense of what it is to be a man, which can often be brutal, unrealistic, pornographic, etc. And it's about the many reactions that come out of that, be it all of the kind of sexual um, malfunctions, problems, um, also, the complex attitudes towards women uh, that a lot of young men will demonstrate. Uh, these misogynistic impulses, rage, hatred, fear, above all, of women. Uh, even not necessarily bad young men, you know. I think it works the other way too. But anyway, I'm, you know, I'm writing about the men in this book. And uh, when, when I wrote this book, I decided that, again, if you're going to write a novel or anything, don't hold back. You don't be timid about it. So uh, I wrote about stuff 
albeit in a fictional sense, that was incredibly, along with all the humor and you know the drinking and the, the funny stuff, I think I wrote about stuff that was incredibly uh, painful or difficult, um, particularly around sexuality. Um, and I, 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 I was glad to write that stuff. But then as it got close to the time when the book was going to be published, I started to feel pretty uh, anxious about it. Um, just the, 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 ex the sense of the, the vulnerability of something like that, that it opens up. And one of the things I worried about was that, Jesus, I'm just going to be branded some kind of misogynist. You know, people will think, God, you're writing about these young guys who have such fucked up relationships with women and such desperately um, angry, you know, relationships and so on. And they're going to... But my girlfriend at the time, she, she was um, a French uh, woman, she, a, a, an author too, actually, and a feminist and so on. And I was telling her this, like, oh, Christ, you know, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna cut my balls off, to, <laughs> to, to put it that way. Um, and she said, no, 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 you don't, you don't get it. It's not going to be that way at all. In fact, you know, I think the opposite is going to happen. You know, there, there's going to be an appreciation of this. And true enough, um, when the book came out, it, you know, it, had a, it did have a certain critical impact, which was delightful, obviously. But what I noticed was that a lot of that the most passionate enthusiasm behind it and insightful writing about it was coming from female critics, m more so maybe than male ones, which, uh, which was gratifying. Because you go out on a limb and anything can happen, you know? It, it, don't get me wrong, it wasn't all that way. There were a few, I was, you know, I was accused of misogyny a couple of times, um, and various people would have maybe a too black and white view of things. Uh, but that doesn't interest, the, the whole black and white view, I mean, that's why I write, is to explore all of this stuff of ambivalence and ambiguity and uh, the mess of life, be it male life, female life. I've written, thus far, I've written more about men than I have about women because, uh, sadly, I don't understand women as much as I intimately as I do men. Uh, so yeah, Thank you. thus far. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you. I think Jonathan said at the beginning that your fiction has been compared to the one, to the fiction of uh, Irving Welsh. How do you feel about that? Do you like his writing? Is it is he an influence? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. I think really, I think when they said that, they were talking about the fact that my first novel was totally full of drugs and sex and drinking and. Uh, working class kind of dial dialect and stuff like that. So I totally see the, and actually I kind of thought, okay, that's a useful kind of meme for people to, you know, to, to see what my book is about, because it's so hard to attract any attention to a new book at all, you know, that it, it can be useful if somebody says, yeah, this is the Irish train spotting, you know, but I think it's totally. Is he a real influence then? Well, I guess I had read uh, and really loved Train Spotting uh, when before I wrote that book, and I'm sure that influenced it. I've since read like he's done some amazing stuff. He wouldn't be uh, a huge figure for me, you know. But that said, I've read like quite a few of his novels, but he t particularly now he certainly I, d I don't really read him anymore, and I think a lot of his later works wouldn't be so great, wouldn't be very interesting to, to me. But I do think that he achieved something. He was liberating something that needed to happen in the, in the 90s particularly. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I think to be honest, more so like maybe my second book and the stuff I'm writing now would be pretty distant. I mean, there's still the kind of drug stuff and all that because that just interests me let's say existentially more than literarily. So that, that would still be going on. But as a writer, he doesn't really enter my kind of frame of perceptions at the moment, you know, but he would have done earlier on, yeah. Thank you. So a helpful writer, yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering um, if you could expand 
a little bit in the way that you're thinking about uh, experiment. Because it seems to me that if we think about experiment in terms of the motivation for it, there are different things one could say. You could think of, say, Virginia Woolf um, it's saying, when she writes about experiment, um, it seems that you want to experiment, she wants to experiment because the, the previous models are, are, you don't take, are, are not really related enough to life. So in that, in that, that's an example of experimenting to bring literature more in, into a more um, direct engagement with life, which seems that would be something that you would be on, on board with, it would seem to me. Um, but then if we think about experiment, we would also think, well, it's a kind of a cliche almost, but you can't really be properly experimental if you don't have a really strong sense of the tradition that you're you're experimenting within. And that then implies a kind of relationship to form and a, a thinking about form, which may um, take you away from the kind of sense of engagement with life or possibly in the sense that you're just, you're thinking more about models. And, mm -hmm. and so is that a tension that you feel in your, in your own work? Um, or is it just kind of that you can just experiment and that's just bringing you closer to life? Or do you, do you feel the kind of a pull between thinking about form and thinking about registering experience um, in, in your work? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I should make, I probably should have made the disclaimer earlier. Experimental writing is a phrase that I use uh, kind of begrudgingly, let's say. Uh, it's not a phrase I ever feel comfortable with because to me, I use it as shorthand for something and uh, because there's kind of no handier phrase for it. But to me, even, it has connotations of stuff that I have no real sympathy for or no real interest in. Again, a kind of dry, cerebral, formalistic approach to literature. I just don't, I'm not interested. What I talk about when I talk about experimental writing is more something that's about, uh, I mean, all my favorite writers are, like I assume very well read and very aware of the tradition and stuff, but my absolute favorite writers, I think that they are very experimental, but they completely transcend the label of experimental writing because that seems so narrow and limiting and almost inherently failed, failed. You know, it's, a, it's an experiment that didn't work. Like when I think of, again, Borges or Bolaño or Jeff Dyer or Maggie Nelson, or you know, you name it, any number of authors. What they're doing seems to me very original, very new, very personally, you know, fresh. But it doesn't. It's too good to warrant that label, experimental literature. It's more about when I talk about experimentalism, I talk about writers who find a way to jettison all of the parts of a tradition, maybe a, a, an arbitrarily dominant tradition. For example, in, Ar in Ireland, the kind of Dubliners model of the short story, let's say. That's one possible avenue for the short story, and yet there's a kind of background assumption that that's the universe, the platonic template of the short story, and you know, there's a similar one for the novel. These are completely arbitrary. You know, The fact that they've hardened, they've solidified into um, Dogmas, it, conventions, it, they are purely that, conventions. And so when I, when, the, the writers who I celebrate and who I love, like be it Flann O'Brien or not only Irish ones, are the ones who just find a way to jettison everything that they're not interested in. If they're not interested in plot or character, then they won't write out of an obligation to fulfill that. They will jettison it and yet manage to write work which generally won't alien, it, it won't just be a private conversation. Like all great writing, it will, it will speak to the reader, it will, it will move something, it will, it will move outside of a solipsistic kind of way of writing. And so it, it, these writers are ones who have found a way to become fully themselves uh, within a tradition. Yeah, I, I hope that somehow answers. So many, many thanks for this, Rob. I think this has certainly been a terrific session, and very timely as well, because I think we have somehow addressed, uh, both in your reading and in the discussion afterwards, many of the issues of this, of this year's conference. So on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you once again for, for accepting our invitation to, to join us here. And I would like to thank also our delegates for their fascinating questions.
So please join me one last time in, in giving Rob a very big round of applause. Just one more thing, uh, housekeeping issue, really. Um, we are going to visit now the museum, and we are going to split into two groups, uh, because apparently we are too many people. So one group will be of Spanish speakers.